Hello and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Hello and welcome to the new series. Coming up, we take a look at all the Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from February 1987. I review the RD Digital Tracer. I review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff is back with a new section. And we have a random end slot. But first, it's the news. Rotronics, the company who produced the wafer drive, has gone into liquidation. Despite efforts to sell the company as a going concern, no deal has been made. Rotronics say they will fulfill any orders that are outstanding, and they are still hopeful that someone will take on their products. The budget label set up by Elite Systems has been put on hold due to the continual legal action by other labels providing the software. Steve Wilcox, it seems, has not paid royalties to many of the third-party labels such as Vortex, as mentioned previously, but now it looks like the 299 Classics label will fade away. Melbourne House, the company that gave us Penetrator, The Hobbit and Muggsy, has been bought by Mastertronic. The budget label has been looking to buy a full-price company for quite a while now, and it seems that the time and the money were right for Melbourne House. The cost has been rumoured to be a seven-figure sum, and games will continue to be produced for each respective label. Damark has announced that they have won the licence to produce computer games based on the three blockbuster movies Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Damark say they will modernise and refurbish the arcade model for the home computer market. Clive Sinclair returns to the computer market with his much-anticipated portable Z88. It is not what users were hoping for though, it's not Spectrum compatible due to the Amstrad buyout, and it does not include Clive's small screen technology. It does have an LCD screen supporting 80 columns and just 8 lines, and from initial views it looks like a business machine, or as Clive labels it, a portable personal computer. Amstrad has announced that a disc version of the Spectrum Plus 2 machine will be released in summer. Named the Spectrum Plus 3, the machine will retain the 128K of RAM and the keyboard of the Plus 2, but will replace the tape deck with a 3-inch disk drive, as seen on the Amstrad CPC machines. Up until now, there has not been a standard disk drive for the Spectrum, with many third-party suppliers releasing their own systems. This held back games companies, but now with this move, Amstrad hoped to see more disk-based games by setting the de facto standard. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. New into the charts this month is Breakthrough, the arcade conversion from US Gold, Shaolin's Road, the fighting game from The Edge, Speed King 2, the motorcycle racing game from Mastertronic, and Starglider, the impressive 3D shooter from Rainbird. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from February 1987. RD Labs began advertising in several computer magazines around the middle of 1982. Their advert was uninspiring and mentioned things like data logging, automatic testing and interactive graphics. The small print mentioned an interface for handling analog input and output but to many users, this would be of little interest. Towards the end of that year, they began to advertise something quite different to the usual joystick interfaces or storage systems usually found, a digital tracer. This device, so the advert claimed, will allow direct transfer from paper to screen using an accurate tracing arm. At just short of 50 pounds though, it put the device out of reach of many people. The system consists of an interface that looks like it was built in someone's shed, to be honest, but does have the LEDs to indicate when things are happening, and a through port. Connected to this is a large plastic articulated arm, at the end of which is a small crosshair. There's also a manual, and of course the cassette. Once plugged in, the first problem immediately becomes clear. How to anchor the arm to stop it moving about. RD Labs supplied some double-sided tape to do this, 
but obviously 30 years later, it's not really sticky anymore. Instead of applying some more tape, I opted just to hold it and see how things went. The manual covers setting up the device, along with details about the included tools and a large program for you to type in. The tape comes with versions of the software for both 16 and 48K models, and you can load each tool separately or all together if you have a 48K machine. The tools include things like drawing, scaling and retrace, and a UDG editor. Let's get down to it then. Once loaded and set up, you'll probably get a continual beeping noise and a message telling you that something is out of screen. You have to move the arm about until the crosshair appears and the beeping stops. You can then line up the crosshair, screen position and the thing you want to trace before starting to draw. Pressing the C will set continuous draw mode and here the arm will draw whatever you trace. You can draw straight lines or circles if you want it to, but these options are not best suited to the trace arm due to its positioning problems. You can turn on and off continuous draw by pressing the C key again. Using this simple control, you can quickly produce a rough estimate of what's on the paper. I say rough because there are many things at play that decide the final outcome. The movement of the arm and how smooth it is, how steady your hand is, how quickly you move, just to name a few. So don't be surprised if your first attempts are less than accurate. Once you get used to it though, things do improve, but the repositioning of the crosshair can sometimes be hit and miss. I will stress again, this is not a drawing tool, it's a tracing tool, and as such there are very limited graphical commands at your disposal. The best use of this would be to build a line drawn picture and then load it into an art package later, something like OCP Art Studio, to finish it off. The retrace option lets you draw things, place them at different areas of screen and rescale them. But as mentioned before, this sort of thing is best done outside of this package. The UDG editor is rubbish and there's no real reason to have it included, so I'm not even going to bother reviewing it. By the end of this review, my hands and arms were aching from trying to hold the arm and at the same time trying to keep the movement as smooth as possible. If you are going to use it for any prolonged period, you'd probably fix it down permanently rather than trying to hold it with your other hand. The RD Digital Tracer was produced to allow conversion of paper-based drawings to screen, and for that, once you get it set up, it works quite well. There are some issues around placement, movement and of course resolution, but this is a spectrum after all, and you're not going to get professional results from a £50 add-on. It was fun to play with, and I can see its uses. An interesting bit of kit then, that can produce good results if you are prepared to put the effort in. After the success of Way of the Exploding Fist, Melbourne House continued on the fighting theme and announced to the world in October 1985 that the follow-up would be a wrestling game. Not only that, but Big Daddy, a famous UK wrestler at the time, would be involved and the game would be called Big Daddy's Rock and Wrestle. A few weeks later and the first adverts began to appear, but there was no mention of Big Daddy. Then it was announced that there would be a delay of some kind and the game would not be ready until Christmas as hoped. Things went quiet for a while, and then the game slipped out quietly sometime in early 1986. The advert claimed a three-dimensional sports simulation, ten opponents, 25 different moves, and a complete rock soundtrack. This then is Rock and Wrestle, released by Melbourne House in 1986. The inlay comes with many positive comments from various reviews, but absolutely no instructions about these 25 different moves or anything else about the game. Digging around on the internet, I located a converted Commodore 64 instruction booklet, and so found out that you are playing a wrestler called Gorgeous Greg, a contender for the world title. The game starts, but it doesn't actually tell you this. Two wrestlers just start to fight and you've got no idea whether you're supposed to be controlling them, or whether it's a demo. Once you've set your keys and chosen your control method, you can actually start the game. Again, it doesn't tell you that you've started, the screen just flickers and two wrestlers appear.
To win the bout, you have to pin your opponent to the floor for a count of three, and to do this, you have to first soften them up using kicks and punches. Trying to get these to work and avoid his attack, though, is very tricky. Eventually, you can grab him and throw him around, if you're good, or perform one of the other moves that I completely failed to do. If you do manage to beat him, then it's on to the next fighter, and there are ten to beat. The controls are confusing and cumbersome to execute, but the computer player obviously knows them all and easily beats the hell out of you every time. I think the round ended, but I was not sure. The two players again continued to move, but when I pressed a key, the game seemed to reset. There was no text saying who had won, or giving a score or position or anything although it was obvious that my player was flat on his back. But it would have been nice at least to have something to indicate that you had lost. The graphics, as you can see, are blocky, and when the players come together, it's hard to see who is who and who's doing what, until one of them hits the canvas, usually you. The animation is good, especially all the different moves you can do, but the audience, though, just sit there in silence, not animated and not really interested in the game, a bit like how I was feeling after a few minutes playing this game. The sound is ripped straight from Exploding Fist, and is very sparse. All in all, this is a bit of a letdown, then. the lack of a start and stop message, the blocky graphics and poor sound, the terrible gameplay, oh and uh, where's that rock soundtrack the advert promised? So it's one to stay away from then. Sonic Boom was released into the arcades in 1987 by Sega. It's a tough shoot 'em up with pickups and end of level bosses. And yes, I'm absolutely rubbish at it. The game was converted to the Spectrum in 1990 by Activision, and thankfully it's a bit easier than the arcade version, but not much. As with all shoot 'em ups, the object is to blow everything up, avoid enemy fire, collect power ups, and reach the end of the level. The landscape is nicely detailed and scrolls smoothly, but the entire game uses two colours only. This avoids colour clash, but makes things very difficult to spot, especially enemy missiles. The screen soon becomes full of things to shoot, avoid or collect, but it's really confusing with the colour scheme. Land-based targets and enemy planes swarm about, and for me, the game soon becomes an avoidance bullet hell shooter, which I'm not particularly fond of. You do have a super shot that explodes out and destroys all enemies, but you only get three of these per level. Control is crisp and it needs to be, but the sound is a major letdown. I mean, this is a 1 to 8k game. There's a weak tune on the intro that often goes out of sync, and the effects in the game are embarrassing. Why is there no use of the AY chip? At the end of the first level you have to take out an aircraft carrier. That is, if you can get that far. Myself, I never made it. Using the infinite lives poke, I did get to the next level, of which there are six, each having different colours and scenery. The background graphics are well drawn across all levels, and very detailed, but again, this makes it difficult to spot enemy fire. I wanted to enjoy this game. I like shoot 'em ups 
but this one for me was just too hard and unforgiving. I tried for a long time to get past level 1 without cheating, and failed each time, and this made the game frustrating, to the degree that I didn't want to play it again. It's a shame really, as it's a nice looking game. Better sound and easier gameplay, or at least an easier learning curve, would have made this a great game. Only try this if you are good at bullet hell games, otherwise, well, don't say I didn't warn you. This is Specball, released in 2016 by Zozosoft. It's a conversion of the 1988 Enterprise game Enterball. There is really no need to explain this type of game, although this one does have some different features that sets it apart from the usual bat and ball games. To get to the next level you don't have to clear all of the blocks, you just have to hit the oval shape, which is quite difficult to describe, but you'll see it on screen if you pay attention. Also, instead of falling bonus items, usually found in this style of game, there's a small area at the bottom left of the screen that occasionally gives up items. These include extra lives, speed up, slow down, and mystery items, some of which remove a lot of the blocks on screen. You have to be careful though, you can get your bat trapped inside. The levels are random after the first one, so you never know what you're going to get, and some of them are quite hard, with the space between your bat and the lower bricks being tiny. You also have to watch out for the portals on either side of the screen. These transport your ball to the opposite side, which is very tricky if things are moving fast. The graphics can't really be rated because mainly they're just square blocks, but the bat and the ball move smoothly enough and control is good. Sound is limited to blocks being hit and level changes, but it suits the game well. It's not often we see this style of game being released for the Spectrum, and this is a nice little addictive game. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Before I get into the first game, I thought I'd say a little bit about the selection criteria I used for the games in this series. There are a huge number of games, 101 as I said in the introduction on the World of Spectrum website, that are Jet Set Willy mods. They range from the strange to, literally, the bizarre and many of them have actually been written by the same author. There are some really prolific authors, some of whom I'll be mentioning throughout this series. And my first criteria was I only picked one game from any one author, which was really difficult in some cases, because as I said, there are some really prolific authors, and some of them have written some really, really good games, many really, really good games. My next criteria was just did the game pull me in? Did I find myself keep playing it? and want to keep playing it, and just playing it for longer than I expected to. And you'll probably hear me say several times in this series, I just started playing it and kept playing it. And the last thing was, did it do anything different to the rest? So I was kind of looking for ones that were a bit different, or if they didn't do something different with the best of their kind. If you've got a favourite Jet Set Willy mod and I've missed it, I'm sorry. But there were so many to choose from, and it was so hard to get this list down to nine. Now for the first game, I've actually picked quite a simple one, which is the Wet Sunday Afternoon Graphical Remake. Now the reason I picked this game was, I started playing it, and as I said earlier, it just pulled me in and I just couldn't stop. Now at first I thought I wouldn't put this game in the list, because really it doesn't change Jet Set Willy itself, the gameplay is absolutely identical. In fact, it's absolutely identical except for one thing. When you get to, I'm sure I've seen this before, the second of the arrows comes from slightly lower in the screen, but other than that I found the gameplay to be absolutely identical. 
But what I found was, I started playing this, and I just wanted to see more. I wanted to see all the changed graphics. And while at first I thought, well, the person who's written this hasn't done much to modify the game. And the person who wrote this was Darren McCorn, according to the World of Spectrum website. He put in a huge amount of work polishing up the graphics. And every single room I went into, I thought, oh, that does look better. That looks different. Now, I'm in no way saying that Matthew Smith's original graphics weren't up to scratch. They were brilliant. And I think I read in an interview Matthew saying he was really, really good at drawing sprites. And I agree with that, and he is. But Darren has just done such a good job on brightening up and refreshing those sprites. I can't say bringing them up to date, because obviously this is an 8-bit game and those are pixels. You'd have to do them in polygons to bring them up to date. But he really has done a very, very good job. In fact, he did such a good job that as I went through all the the game and went through all the screens, I just kept going and going. And this game, I actually completed without the use of save states. One of the things I really like is what he did to the monks that are in the Forgotten Abbey and other screens. I love the way that their arms now move. It's much better than the original, much more comic than the original. But it isn't just one or two graphics that look good. Right from the start of the game, when you first see it, you think, wow, that's a difference and that looks good. The loo in the bathroom looks absolutely terrific. And then when you move on to the top landing... Now, on the top landing, I've never known what the baddie that moves along the bottom of the screen is. I've always thought it looked a bit like a flick knife. I think I read once on the World of Spectrum website someone referring to it as a hoover, and I guess it could kind of look like a hoover. But what Darren's done with that is turn it into a kind of creature with a long nose, a kind of funny bird-type creature. And that looks really, really good, and I'm quite pleased, because there's no mistaking what it is, really. You're not thinking, oh, what is that anymore? Then when you move into the Nightmare Room, Maria, the redrawing of Maria looks really, really good. Much better than the old one. She looks a bit more feisty, in my opinion, which is exactly how you'd expect of somebody who is preventing you from going to bed. And the other thing that looks great in the Nightmare Room is the flying pig that you turn into. I love the way he's got that little smile. Then as you move through the game a bit further, as you come to the rooms with the ice creams in them, now the redrawing of the ice creams looks really good. They're animated now, they kind of twist, and I don't think they had any animation in the original. And then again, you come to the rooms with the monks in them, that I've already mentioned. Now when you get to the tree route, I really like the animation of the rabbit. And on the bridge, that thing that goes up and down, that looks really good too. What I'm not saying is that what Darren's done is better than what Matthew Smith did. Some of the sprites I don't think are as good as Matthew Smith's original. I actually don't like what he's done with Willy. I didn't think Willy needed tampering with at all. He seems to have changed his hat, kind of put a stripe on it. Makes it look a bit more like a straw boater. Now that's okay, but... I don't know, I like the original top hat. And also that big priest's head that you get in the chapel. I think I prefer the original on that. And those faces, the one that you got in the orangery that moves up and down, that face I don't think was as good as the original. However, that didn't stop me from wanting to go on and look at all the rest of the graphics, and there are some great ones in there. I'd thoroughly recommend anyone who is a Jet Set Willy fan who likes playing Jet Set Willy and knows the mansion a bit. I think you've got to know the original. Have a good go of this game and see what you think of the graphics and whether you think they're an improvement over the originals or not. And there's not much more to say about this game than that. It's a graphical refresh, but a really good one and one that's really worth playing through. Till next time, happy gaming. Welcome to the 16K game, and this is Haunted Hedges, released by Micromega in 1983, and written by Derek Brewster. If you haven't guessed already, this is a typical Pac-Man clone, but with a difference. The first thing you notice is the graphics. There's no flat blue maze here, like the arcade, instead you get an impressive 3D effect that reminds me of games like Android 2 or Cyclone, 
but this game came out before those titles. The idea, if it needs explaining, is that you have to eat all the dots, although the instructions ramble on at something about a spirit world and collecting gold coins and avoiding the guardians and picking up ice axes to enable you to kill the guardians, blah blah blah, it's a Pac-Man game. There are five difficulty levels, and these indicate how intelligent the ghosts, sorry, guardians are, and range from zero intelligence to super. The graphics are nice, but move in 8 pixel character jumps, but that doesn't really detract too much from this game. Sound is used well, with various zaps and effects for different things. The ghosts, oh, sorry, spirits, even on the easiest level seem to track you down and corner you in. Although the game is still very playable. There are random bonus items to collect. And overall, this is a nice little game that's just over 9 kilobytes in size. If you like Pac-Man games, certainly give this one a try. Welcome to the extra bit at the end of the show. This is the place where all the odds and ends will go that don't really fit into any category. If you remember in episode 26, I did a feature on digitally uploading games to real hardware. At the time I covered what I thought were all the options, but it turns out I was wrong. ZX Trans is a command line program that allows you to upload games via a serial port connected to Interface 1. Obviously you'll need Interface 1 to do this. You'll also need a special serial cable, details of which can be found in the Interface 1 manual or the documents that come with Spectaculator. You simply plug in the cable into your PC serial port and into Interface 1. You set your PC serial port to 8N1 and flow control set to hardware. You set the Spectrum's binary channel to 19200 baud. And start the load process. You enter this command into the command line, obviously running from the ZX Trans folder and having a game already at hand, and hit return, and the data should begin to squirt down the line. ZX Trans can upload Z80, Snap files and SZX files, and I find SZX to be smaller and therefore faster to transfer. The speed is not breathtaking, but it will load Jetpack, which is around 9k of data, if you use an SZX file, in around 1 minute 30 seconds. The tape version, by comparison, will load in about 2 minutes 20 seconds. ZX Trans was written by George Beckett and can be downloaded from his website, the address of which is on screen now. Be sure to read the documentation that comes with the program as it covers many other things in much more detail. Eventually the upload ends and the game is ready to play. So there you have it, another way to load games into real hardware using modern technologies.